Um, I would like to welcome every one of us uh, for uh, coming to this, um, the first uh, annual Congress on Iguinites. Um, my name is Thank God Ebenezer, and I'm a bioinformatician at the European Bioinformatics Institute in Hingston near Cambridge. And I work within the Universal, uh, Universal Protein Resource Team, the Unipro team. So um, last year we had the first, um, the kickoff meeting of the African, of the Iguina International Network uh, rather. And uh, the idea is that we're going to basically be having annual meetings, uh, particularly. And um, today we'll, we'll be starting that meeting. And um, I don't have any slide in terms of the, the, the brief overview of what we've done, uh, basically. But what I have here is a rundown of the program. So I will just um, talk about uh, what we've done briefly. Then I would hand over to Niho who is the conference chair, to kind of welcome us all. And then we'll move over to um the first session of the of the meeting so so far over the past 12 months um we've been having meetings uh, once every uh, two months uh, mainly the executive committee meeting and also the uh, science committee meeting the idea behind the executive committee meeting is to try to understand how we can better run in and or how to institu institutionalize in and how to actually starts to uh, ensure that there is sustainability within the Iguina International Network. And in the science committee, we're, we've been trying to set up the Iguina Genome Project, mainly to try to sequence several species of uh, Iguina. So I hope that um, sometime within this conference, maybe I think that should be on Thursday, um, John Knight would also be talking about the progress we've made in that regard in trying to institutionalize in, as well as Neho and uh, Michael Ginger will also talk about on the progress on the science committee, basically what, what has been ongoing. So uh, with this, I would like to thank every one of us for coming. And I also uh, like to welcome every one of us. So I would um, hand over to Neil, who would um, welcome us and then we'll move to the first session of the conference. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank God for that introduction. And um, I just want to say on behalf of everyone, thanks. Uh, we think we all want to thank thank god for all of the work he's done um uh, for this uh, community over the last year or so since we last met uh, i think my job is to to uh, as the host organization to welcome you to the earlham institute and were we all meeting in person which unfortunately we're not again for the second year we'd be meeting in the, in the, the building uh, behind me uh, which is the earlham institute i just want to say a little bit about who we are and why we're supporting this meeting so, so we're a government funded institute um, which specializes um, in genomics, synthetic biology and data driven bioscience. We aim to develop and use modern technologies to drive the generation of novel biological data sets uh, and our expertise in computational biology to, to be able to analyze those and, and answer some pressing challenges in the biosciences um, is probably um, uh, poignant in a way that that about a four hour train journey from where I am now in, in Glasgow, they're actually meeting at COP26 to discuss, you know, how humanity responds to climate change. And it's, I think we'll work on you cleaner or, you know, in one way or another, and it's kind of thought of as a kind of forgotten group of organisms, but actually it's vitally important to, in carbon cycling as a sentinel for, um, pollution and for biodiversity is one of the most taxonomically diverse organisms in on the planet and is potentially um, maybe vitally important for the production of biomaterials or, or sustainable food so um, you know I think it's you know important that we remember that when we talk about the kind of the science that we're doing today as well as basically understanding evolution and, and fundamental biology so um, before I go to the next session, I should also thank the Erlem Institute events team, uh, Rowan and Emily, uh, who have put on put a lot of work into the registration and, and for supporting the, the um, conference over the next few days. So, uh, uh, so thank you all for attending. Um, I think now we want to is it hand over to Michael Ginger uh, from the University of Huddles Huddersfield, who's going to be chairing the first session. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, thank God. Hello, everybody. So, yes, I have the pleasure of chairing the first session. Um, I just 
I want to start off though by echoing Neil's comment and acknowledging the huge amount of time that thank God's put into making this conference happen for everybody over 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 the next three or four days. Um, we've got three short talks to start off the session before the screen then goes uh, the, before the screen's open for for, for questions. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker, please, Janis Korlach from Pacific Biosciences. I don't know if you want to share screen. Jonas? Yes, I'd like to. Can you see it? I can see that perfectly. So in your own time, if you'd like to talk to us about sequencing complex non-human systems, please. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And I really like to uh, start by expressing my gratitude for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm not a Euclidean researcher. I'm a method developer, but I hope that I'll be able to describe to you some opportunities that I see for euclinoid research. And uh, those are in a number of uh, topics that I've listed here. And you see there's seven topics with a 15 minute talk. So by the very nature, I'll, I'll go relatively quickly. I can make the slides available, uh, certainly. And I hope that it's it serves as a good starting point and foundation for a discussion um, that, that I look forward to. So uh, very briefly, um, uh, the you may know PEC Bio, uh, we've been around for over a decade now, but uh, really, there's been a shift, I think, in the um, applicability and the adoption of the technology with the advent of HiFi reads. And so um, you're probably also familiar with what HiFi reads are. In short, they're the um, they're a data type that combines the read length of the long reads that you know about with the high accuracy. So uh, HiFi reads are sequence reads that are both very long and also very accurate. They can be up to 20,000 base pairs in length, so about 100 times longer than the average Illumina read. This is drawn to scale. And then uh, you can see here that uh, they're uh, very similar to Illumina reads, both with regard to the absolute value of uh, Q30 and plus um, sequence reads. And the distribution is very narrow, which makes the bioinformatic analysis um, a lot easier. And so um, in addition to this extraordinary accuracy, there are other um, uh, characteristics that, uh, such as even coverage and little uh, GC bias and so forth, that uh, lends themselves um, to uh, attractive features relative to genomics research. It's a single molecule technique, and so it has been shown to be very useful for applications like genome assembly, variant crawling, long-range phasing, epigenetics, and complex communities resolution. So in the following, I'd like to um, talk about some examples of uh, the list I've showed on how this can be used for protist research. So for high quality genome assemblies, uh, most if not all the um, large biodiversity and genomics initiatives are using uh, now PecBio HiFi reads as a core of their uh, efforts. The assemblies are based on HiFi assemblies. And so um, of course, almost all of these are multicellular organisms. But the technology has also been used um, uh, uh, to some degree for um, assembling protists. And so I've listed some examples that I know of uh, here with the pictures. And um, uh, I won't go into these uh, in detail. As I mentioned, I'm happy to make the slides available. Uh, you, will, uh, you might uh, say that, well, you know, most of these have relatively small genome sizes, and that's true. However, there are some larger ones here as well. This is a new preprint. Um, and this is 700 megabases, so about half the size of Euglena, Euglena and so forth. And certainly on the multicellular uh, organism level, um, species that have much larger genomes than the human genome, I think the, the record is somewhere around 30 or 40 gigabase genome size. And I know some even larger ones are in the works uh, using the HiFi technology. So um, I know that about three or four or five years ago, you've uh, applied PecBio. Back then, it was the long noisy reads um, to the Euclina glassless reference genome. And I think it's, it's the technology has advanced uh, uh, very much, both with regard to the HiFi paradigm, but also with regard to throughput increases and cost reduction. So today, on a 1.4 gigabase genome, it would probably take on the order of two smart cells comfortably uh, to get a very high quality um, uh, reference uh, uh, genome for an organism like Euclina glassless. Um, and um, recent advances have uh, gone towards uh, sequencing the genome of single cells. Now, this has been spearheaded in the human sector. And so there's two uh, papers, one preprint uh, out of uh, Adam Amir's lab in Sweden, and then uh, SmoothSeq out of China, where um, um, the researchers have combined these uh, single um, cell droplet encapsulation techniques and then 
isolating the DNA and amplifying it either by MDA or um, with this um, transposon mediated reaction and uh, reporting a fairly good um, uh, coverage. And uh, of course you get um, the information in uh, chunks of 10 or 20 KB read. So um, there's inherent phasing and uh, a lot of information. So this is sort of the tip of the spear and, and uh, technology is advancing. And uh, uh, there is some uh, promise that single cells can be uh, sequenced with um, high quality and a good degree of completeness and, and so forth. Um, the next topic I want to talk about is pan genomes. Of course, it is uh, good to have a reference genome, but then critical to get uh, information about the biodiversity within a species to understand the core, the core genes, which of course are mediate and critical functions and are responsible for stable evolution, but then um, uh, perhaps even more important understanding the dispensable genes that um, lend themselves to the organism um, uh, getting adaptive traits and allowing for rapid evolution, as was mentioned, climate change and so forth. And so this has been uh, demonstrated in protists. I've uh, listed here two examples about intraspecific variation in protists. And here you see the sort of same uh, Venn diagram that I had conceptually on the previous slide, um, showing that uh, the core genome and then the associated um, dispensable genes. Uh, here is another example of a nanoflagellate of four high quality draft genomes and looking at the gene content and um, the uh, um, uh, essential genes like the Busco genes and uh, which are present in which strain and giving an, uh, starting to give an understanding about the pan genome of these uh, uh, particular protists. Now going on to another aspect of biodiversity, which of course is to catalog and characterize the uh, species diversity that there is to begin with. Um, this has been done, of course, through uh, the so-called barcode of life sequencing, cytochrome oxidase or uh, other markers for other organisms, spearheaded by uh, Paul Habert um, at uh, University of Guelph a few years ago. He had a paper entitled a sequel to Sanger, Sanger sequencing, amplicon sequencing that scales. And because fundamentally it's a single molecule technique, he can now replace the workflow that he had, which had lots and lots of plates and then Sanger sequencing because the amplicon is uh, longer than the size afforded by next generation sequencing and can replace that with just one two because the molecules are sequenced uh, one by one um, with uh, PecBio. And so this in the paper, he's using the SQL system for 10,000 plex, 10,000 samples per uh, run. And then with the newest instrument, the SQL2 system, uh, he is routinely sequencing 36,000 um, specimen on a single sequencing run. So this then becomes um, very high throughput and uh, um, cost effective. And of course, then uh, this has been utilized for long read meta barcoding. Um, and there are a few papers that I've listed here. And of course, the advantage there over the short read or even Sanger uh, sequencing method is that you're sequencing much more of the ribosomal uh, DNA, uh, the full length 18S, the ITS sequences, the 28S. Um, and so that gives you, of course, a lot more resolution um, with regard to the uh, taxonomic uh, orders and taxonomic categories. And so this has been utilized in the context of uh, protist research in a number of papers um, starting pretty early on. And this is a very nice uh, review article that uh, is less than a month ago, I think that you may have seen, um, where the authors conclude that meta barcoding is on the verge of an exciting added dimension thanks to the maturation of high throughput long read sequencing so that a robust eco-evolutionary framework of protist diversity is within reach. And they discuss the benefits of having long and accurate uh, PEC bio hi fi reads for this type of research. Uh, now moving on to the RNA side, um, the isoseq method, as you may know, full length transcript sequencing using hi fi reads has been around for quite a while. And um, what uh, the isoseq reads afford is full length transcript reads um, for each uh, sequence reads for each molecule. And that is in contrast to the short read approaches, which have to uh, uh, assemble um, from the short reads that span the splice junctions of the multiple isoforms that you have from a gene. And of course, this has been utilized in the context of Euglena research. Uh, there was a paper on the um, characterizing the order of removal of conventional, non-conventional introns. So the, the progression of splicing uh, from the nuclear transcripts of Euglena gracilis, um, studying those splicing intermediates and uh, isoseq revealed that 
in this study that non-conventional introns are removed rapidly and then um, in a rapid way, uh, but later than the spliceosomal introns. And so um, the observed accumulation of transcript with conventional introns removed and non-conventional present suggests that there may be an existence of a time gap, maybe even a um, localization uh, gap between the two types of splicing. So because um, this was done uh, about three or four years ago, again, uh, it could only be applied to, I think, two amplicons, two genes. And so again, with the increase in throughput and the reduction in cost, this would be very straightforward now to do on a whole genome level and looking at all the transcripts at the same time and seeing in the same type of experiment, uh, quantitatively uh, identifying how the splicing occurs and how those um, molecular mechanisms um, uh, proceed. Um, and there has been uh, recent um, uh, advances in the uh, throughput. Um, and uh, uh, dramatically increasing the number of transcript reads that you can get from a sequencing run. So this paper by the Broad Institute, a preprint by the Broad Institute, by concatenating um, multiple, in this case, 15 full length transcripts into a single molecule that is then uh, sequenced for HIFI read. Um, the authors uh, described this MOS isoseq method that increases the throughput by over an order of magnitude and gives you nearly 40 million cDNA reads per smart cell 8M per sequencing run, a 30-fold boosted discovery of differentially spliced genes, robust cell type clustering. And so the authors conclude that um, we're now going and transitioning um, the scientific uh, field of RNA-seq from gene expression analysis to transcript isoform expression analysis, having that much um, a greater uh, capacity and throughput allows you to get deeper insight into the transcriptome complexity. So lastly, and I'll close with the last two, um, I know that there are some um, topics related to bioengineering. And so PAC bio sequencing has been utilized for um, uh, deep mutational scanning and evolution of engineering uh, particular systems. I've listed a few um, papers here, but the um, the principle is always the same in that if you have a, a library, a large library of different mutant variants, you can sequence that accurately and characterize the library of, with that diversity with PEC biosequencing. And so then, um, you know, this paper here for COVID uh, is using yeast, but you can maybe uh, imagine swapping that out with euglena and then uh, doing a functional screen and uh, then selecting <clears throat> the particular mutants that uh, you're interested in. And then either you can sequence those out directly, again, with uh, PacBio or what is done here in uh, uh, cases where you have a very large diversity, you can link it with a barcode, and then you just read it out with the Illumina sequencing. Uh, you read the barcode, and then by virtue of uh, linking this with the full length um, uh, library um, uh, member, um, you understand. And so because of the full length, you can um, fully understand uh, multiple mutations over a long uh, distance um, and uh, really uh, accelerate um, the projects that are uh, aimed this way. And then lastly, in genome editing, um, not too long ago, there was a, a PNAS paper, um, which I thought was, was really cool um, on a protist um, um, combining uh, Cas9 genome editing with an inducible pre recombinase to um, essentially generate a strain in which the potentially unlimited stacking of knockouts and addition of new genes is readily achievable. And so PacBio was used here to verify the correct integration and subsequent marker reporter excision to make sure that what you think you were doing on paper actually happened in the tube. And so this is a nice paper demonstrating an acceleration of the pace of industrial strain development that um, I think would, would likely be uh, perhaps um, uh, adaptable to uh, euglena. So with this, um, I'll, I'll stop. I hope that I've given you a few examples um, where I see really exciting new opportunities for euglenoid research, whether it be reference quality genomes and finally getting a high quality genome of the organisms and species that you're most interested in, looking at the pan genome for intraspecies diversity, um, looking at long, meta, long read meta barcoding for species identification and monitoring the biodiversity in the context of climate change, transcript isoform level, uh, biology, bioengineering, genome editing. So um, I'd like to again, thank you for the opportunity and uh, please um, uh, reach out to me if you have any questions, my email is down here. And I'd be happy to answer any questions either now or at the end of the session. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Jonas. That was lots of examples and a super way to start a meeting. Thank you. If you'd like to stop sharing screens rather than take questions now, we'll follow as the programs suggested and we'll have the first three talks and then we'll open the screen for, for, for questions of, of people. So with that, thank you, Jonas. And our, over to our second speaker, who is Masami Nakazawa from Osaka Prefecture University in Japan. Um, Masami, are you there, please? Yes. Hello. Are you? Hello. We, yeah. Hello. Masami is going to talk to us on the, 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 the topic of anaerobic mitochondria in Euglena. And are you going to share screen and slides with us as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to share my recorded, recorded presentation. Perfect. Can you see this? Yes. yes I'd like to start this. Yep, please, in your own time, Masami. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Masami Nakazawa, a staff of Osaka Prefecture University in Japan. First of all, I'd like to thank organizing committee members for giving me such a great opportunity. Then, let's get started. Today, I'd like to talk about anaerobic mitochondrial metabolism in euglenoids. This is my topic list. In the first half, I would like to overview anaerobic mitochondrial fatty acid synthesis and energy metabolisms in euglena groceries. In the second half, I will talk about anaerobic metabolisms in other euglenoid. Euglena glossaries stores polysaccharide paramilum in aerobic culture condition from excess amount of photosynthetic products or carbon source obtained by osmotrophic processes. Paramilum degrades rapidly when cells are exposed to anaerobic or hypokinetic culture conditions, and wax esters are produced in the cell. Wax esters could be used as biofuel after some modifications, so understanding wax ester metabolism is an attractive topic for both basic biology and applied biotechnology. This map shows reduced metabolic pathway from pyramidon to wax esters. Previous studies showed fatty acid component of wax esters are synthesized in mitochondria without ATP consumption. What we find, find these pathways are not enough to understand anaerobic mitochondrial metabolism. We inhibited mitochondrial respiration by complex 1 inhibitor rotenone. Rotenone induced both decrease of wax cell production and intracellular ATP levels. These results suggested that there should be undiscovered links between mitochondrial respiration and anaerobic metabolisms. So we tried to determine detailed metabolic components in anaerobic mitochondrial metabolisms using gene silencing. This map showed summary of our results. Electron produced from NADH oxidation on mitochondrial complex 1 transferred to radicinum R cube. Electron transfer from a protein ETF and finally transferred to acyl CoA dehydrogenase ACD and acyl-CoA. 
is produced. This was the first report of anaerobic respiration coupled with long-chain fatty acid synthesis. I'd like to introduce our latest study briefly. This topic was accepted in last week. We further investigate anaerobic mitochondrial respiration from the viewpoint of redox cofactor balances. Wax cell cell synthesis is coupled to anaerobic respiration. And these processes require NADH here and here. But only NADPH supply is known in the previous metabolic models here by pyruvate NADP plus oxygen reductase. So there is the cofactor imbalance. We found cofactor conversion from NADPH to NADH by mitochondrial transhydrogenase NMT is indispensable for sustaining anaerobic metabolism in Uganda grasses. NMT plays important role in both NADH supply and ATP production in anaerobic mitochondria. I think anaerobic mitochondrial metabolism of Euglena is one of the most reasonable ones to sustain anaerobic energy production. I would like to move on to the next topic about anaerobic metabolism in one of euglenoid strain Eutrophigella. Wax cell production in anaerobic metabolism is only found in Eugrena glaciers. We try to find other wax cell producing organisms from related species. We focused one of marine eugrenoids Eutrophigella. In Mary Microbial Eukaryote Transcriptome Sequence Project, MMETSP, data, we found two transcriptome data for Eutrophigella, for grade 1 and for grade 2. Our T blast and search towards Uglana grassroots anaerobic metabolic components revealed that plate 1 Eutrophigella strain have all the components with very high homology to Uglana grassroots. In contrast, plate 2 Eutrophigella strain showed very high homology to rhodokinum synthetic gene RQUA and mitochondrial transhydrogenase, but relatively low homology in wax acid production pathway enzymes in Euglena grassroots. Then we obtain Eutrophigella strains from Japanese algae culture collection. When clade 1 U Trepchella strain needs 2325 exposed to anaerobic conditions, nonpolar components accumulated in the cell. This green shows. Gas chromatography analysis showed clade 1 strain of U Trepchella showed wax ester production, this blue line. The composition of wax esters were very similar 
to that of Ugrena groceries. This and this. This is summary of my presentation. First, anaerobic wax acid production is effective energy producing pathway in Uglena with anaerobic respiration. Second, anaerobic wax acid production was found in Utrecht Jelly as well as in Uglena glaciers. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Masami. That was perfect. Again, we will wait until we've had all three presentations before 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 we open the screen up for questions. If you'd like to stop sharing, thank you, Masami. Um, our third speaker is P.K. Yelkalainen from the World Federation of Parasitologists. And I understand, P.K., you're not going to share screen with slides but you are going to show photographs is that correct yes that is correct okay, so, so the, the screen is yours thank you so much uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation and uh, congratulations on this wonderful congress it's uh, first in its series so we are really making history today it's uh, really a pleasure to be with you all my name is Pika Jokelainen, and indeed, I will not show the screen. You will just see me and yourself. So we are here together. I will show some physical photos. So if you want to see them more in detail, you can try to kind of pin me so the, the one of the, and my, my picture becomes larger. So I will show two photos that I have here in my office wall. And then I will say one that I have been looking at a lot today. It's so beautiful. And I will also ask you all to imagine a, a few additional images. And the first image I would like you all to think about is a little girl sitting on a rock reading a book about plants. And this is really the first thing where I start my, my talk. And what I hope to, to bring with my, my brief talk is thinking about how everything we do is interconnected. So this little girl sitting on a rock reading a book about plants, that was, that was me. My interest in biology and different life forms started very young. And I had the weirdest hobby. Uh, I was memorizing scientific names of plants. And I, I still remember quite many of them. And I had interest in the classification, the comparisons and, and understanding the life and the lifestyle of these different plants. And I had an interest to understand the diversity and how some plants like to live together in, in uh, certain types of environments. I was born and, and living at that point in northern part of Finland. So it's not the most optimal place for many plants that I could see in that book. But uh, quite many plants had well adapted, they were thriving, they were, they were in good health. And I could also already at that point understand that human actions were affecting the environment, the health of the environment. And it was the environment where those plants were living and where I was living. And I, I really felt connected to, to all this. From there, I then continued with my interest. Uh, I became veterinarian, did a PhD. Uh, and here in the program, indeed, under my name is mentioned that I'm the first vice president of World Federation of Parasitologists. I'm based in Denmark at State and Serum Institute, which is a public health institute that also has veterinary preparedness functions. So, so my work today is a lot about One Health. And this word One Health, it's a little bit like a buzzword. But actually that concept was there already when I learned those scientific names. So I think it's all about the health of all life forms, how that is interconnected. And we easily think one health is about human health and animal health, or rather at least in, in among those people I often talk with, we talk mainly about diseases that humans and other animals share, so zoonoses. And that is a relevant part, but, but that's not the whole picture. Um, my own work has focused a lot on zoonoses, especially parasitic zoonoses. 
And that's actually an interesting concept also parasites, uh, how we define when a microorganism or organism lives a parasitic lifestyle, because actually a good parasite will not cause too much trouble. That's, that's the way to, to live. What I find interesting is these host pathogen interactions, how the same microorganism, for example, a parasite can cause very different outcomes in a host depending on host species and the immunity of the host, for example, and how these same microorganisms often also have an environmental stage and how they can thrive and survive there in very different um, environments. And, and here comes also one aspect that I think it's important in One Health thinking, it's comparisons. Comparisons of different organisms, their interactions, their environment situations, how we can learn a lot from these things. This takes me to another image that I would like you to imagine. So, so imagine a young researcher who is a PhD candidate looking into a microscope in a pathology laboratory and the same person also looking into a microscope in cell culture laboratory. And there's the same organism that this person is looking at, but very different situations. And this is a picture of my favorite parasite microorganism, Toxoplasma gondii. Looks like this when it's taken out from the brain tissue of a mouse in this case. So this full moon, it is an intracellular gathering of slowly dividing predusoid stages of this parasite. And there is practically no clear information or other reaction around it. So it's, it's quite uh, peacefully living there. The parasites are almost like dormant there. They are waiting for another host to come and eat this mouse. And this is how the parasites get into a new host. And the parasite does not harm its near environment too much because it hopes to live long in this host until the host becomes eaten. And this is how the life cycle goes on. And it's the host immunity that's the reason that it stays like this. Because if the host immunity would like become severely compromised, the parasite could convert into a tachycoid stage looking like this. And, and this, is the, this is the stage that it's seen in acute infection and also in the cell culture where there's no immunity limiting it. And uh, yeah, the parasites go into the cells, they multiply, aggress and go to new cells, leaving empty areas, kind of broken, broken environment in there. And if they just continue this in the end, there will be no cells left. And this is when the parasites themselves also die. So they actually lose their home in the process. And, and this, this, it's just an example how the life, I think we can say the health of this microorganism, it is dependent on the host cells and the organism that is made of those host cells. It is really about the environment and, and uh, how, how it's there, where it is. So it kind of needs the host to limit it for, for the balance. That is how this intracellular parasite lives. At the same time, same parasite has a really resistant environmental form. So that's just fascinating. But indeed, I mean, zoonoses, they are diseases of One Health, but One Health is more than these classical zoonoses. It's really, well, the name says health. So I think it is the health of the different life forms, lifestyles, ecosystems, environments, and um, how different organisms live and thrive and continue through changes, how they evolve and adapt. And I think we can learn a lot about this across organism types. So now two more images to imagine. One, focusing on your research topic. I think we go for many of us now to microscopic, even molecular level. And another would be our planet. So zoom out to think how this all looks like from space. So basically the organisms and the small details about them that we all study, they are part of this. And we are part of this. And, and we can certainly learn a lot across organism types. We can learn from their life, the smallest molecular details, 
the metabolism aspect, uh, also from their impacts and from their potential. So one health, how the health of everything is connected, how everything is connected, it is a concept that has many layers and levels from microscopic to macroscopic and all the way to kind of global. I, I really think that this concept or the idea, it brings it all together. It emphasizes the direct and also indirect links. It can challenge classifications and uh, encourage to learn across any type of silos we have been building and learning from each other. And it can be the applications, it can be the using as a model organism or using as sentinels, it can be using in education, it can be the methods that we are using, that is the thing that links these things together and to the, to the One Health. So I think this actually is very much like was said in the welcome, welcome speech about how, how we can uh, think in a, in a little bit bigger picture. So this is echoing really much the same thing. And so my main message really is that collaborating within and for One Health can, can bring us together and across sectors and to this multidisciplinary thinking uh, where we can learn a lot also often about things we didn't think about before because they were not there so clear from our point of view from that little rock where we were sitting and reading just one book. So as the final image, this one, it's beautiful and uh, this is where we are gathered today and for these days and can learn a lot about. I think the program is so brilliant. It really brings different things together. So, so thank you for organizing. Looking forward to the coming days. Thank you very much, Pika. Hopefully, with respect to the One Health, I think we're going to hear a little bit more about the Sentinel Behaviour Review, Gleena, in talks today and later on in the week as well. Um, We've got time now for, 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 for questions of all three speakers. Um, in terms of asking your questions, I've got the chat open, so people are welcome to ask their questions in the chat. Similarly, you're welcome to pop your Zoom hand up and, and we can go to you um, for, 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 your, for, your, for, your, for your question in a spoken format. Um, While I wait for first questions to potentially appear, I've got a I've got a question that I was going to ask. And can I turn to Jonas first, please? Is there anything? What are the limitations of the hi-fi read approach? Is there anything that that people shouldn't get too excited about what the technology can do, as well as all the stuff that it can do? Are there things where we shouldn't get too excited, please, or too excited yet? Um, so I, I would, I would generally answer that, you know, hi-fi reads have been around for a little less than two years now. And so I think the community is, um, um, adapting, uh, their research and, and exploring, I should say, exploring, um, this new data type for their research. Um, and so that's been an ongoing and very exciting progress. And, you know, if you had asked me four months ago, whether single cell genome sequencing as possible, I would have said, you know, probably not. And, and then we saw this paper in the preprint, um, which are, are pretty exciting. And so I would say, uh, you know, uh, um, there is really a, um, what, what I've seen is um, a, a very rapid advancement and application of the technology to all sorts of different areas. And uh, I would say it really depends on the particular research questions. And so this is why I'm very excited and, and thankful for uh, being able to uh, join this conference because I want to hear from you what you would like to do. And then um, uh, we can figure out whether hi fi reads have utility there. I would say, you know, we, we don't yet have the billions of reads uh, counting that Illumina uh, Nova Seeks have. So if you have an application, I would say, where uh, in particular with short fragments, maybe like eDNA and then things like that, um, uh, that's not suitable for the technology. So think more in the millions or tens of millions of reads um, per sequencing run. Um, and, uh, but other than that, I mean, we've seen really a, uh, a quite 
amazing adoption. You know, <clears throat> this morning I saw a preprint from Jay Shinduri uh, about DNA encoding in living cells. So he's actually writing Shakespeare into, uh, you know, organisms and uh, and uh, needs the long and accurate reads to uh, to read that out. So it's just uh, it really been a tremendous um, uh, evolution. So. Um, I apologize. I'm not asking specific. I'm not answering it specifically. Um, I would say what I would like to provide is the framework of 20,000 base reads um, that are as accurate as Illumina reads, and think about it in the terms of millions, both for DNA and RNA um, and methylation detection. And uh, let's see what you can do with that. Is that? Uh, I hope that's an acceptable answer. No, that's fine. That's fine, Janas. We have got one question in the chat and I can see one Zoom hand. I'm going to turn first to the question in the chat that's come from Neil and it's to Pika and it's what is known about signaling molecules either released or perceived by the parasite that you showed? Thank you, really interesting question. So, so the parasite that I was talking about is Toxoplasma condi and in the recent years that the understanding of, of exactly this has been really increasing the most that I know, it's not exactly my main field, but I've been reading and, and, and learning about is the egress, how it decides to come out the cell. And there is actually, it is a multiple steps, steps thing. And for example, how, how calcium, how certain really things happens, which order and so on that's described. And so I actually will not answer too detailed what, it, what, what this exactly, I would like to rather point out that this is one of the things where um, toxoplasma is used as a model organism for, for malaria parasites, plasmodium, because they are quite similar and toxoplasma is so much easier to, to uh, study in cell cultures and, and in, in um, animal models. So indeed an, an idea about that sometimes we know more about it for one organism and then we can learn about the others. Okay, thank you, Pika. Raj, you've got your hand up please. You're on mute, Raj. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah. Uh, my question to Jonas. Yeah. Mm. Passpy seems to be a very good platform for uh, getting this long read sequencing. So uh, in, in, in case of Euglena, so we know in the Euglena community, we know that this Euglena genome is very difficult to sequence, uh, mostly because of its DNA modification, various kind of DNA modification, for example, base J. So how does this uh, PASPI platform would be useful for the researcher so in, can, in case of sequencing this difficult to sequence genome like Euglena? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I understand that it's uh, difficult both with regard to base J and also the repetitive content. So let me talk about base J first. And uh, we collaborated a few years ago, a very uh, enjoyable collaboration with Peter Myler and others to demonstrate that the technology can detect base J as in the context of sequencing. So the base J will um, uh, cause a little delay on the polymerase's progress, and by that kinetic signature, we can identify the location of base J. And so this is still uh, enabled, and by um, the HIFA reads um, are interrogating the same base of the same molecule multiple times, so you get better statistical power, and it sequences the forward and the reverse strand of the same DNA molecule independently, so uh, you have strand resolution as well. And so with base J, I think that's uh, you know, that has been demonstrated and is imminently, uh, you know, doable to detect the base J locations as part of the sequencing. Um, and with regard to the size and the complexity of the Euglena genome, um, I think that should be fine um, because, uh, you know, very repetitive and highly complex genomes have been sequenced and resolved with the technology. Uh, one of the most recent high-profile examples is the human genome. Um, and the telomere to telomere consortium for the first time completing the human genome, getting through complete centromeres using the HIFA reads and resolving even the most difficult uh, repetitive context. Thanks, Jonas. Thanks, Raj. We've got another question. We've got two questions in the chat. The first of those questions is from Vladimir to Masami. The profile of fatty acids for the second clade of Eutreptella that seems very different from the Euglena gracilis and the first clade. 
Is this caused by technical problems in the measurement or is there really a different and smaller set of fatty acids for the wax esters in the different nucleonids? So. Yes, yeah, thank you, Rajin Mio. And I think uh, in, in, this, in this case, I analyzed fat, um, total fatty, fatty acids and wax esters by GCFID. So the signal shows not, not only wax esters, I think the um, clade, clade, store, clade two strain of uterine progeria did not make wax ester, and and that that signal showed other other fatty acid acid or other species profiles. I think so. Yeah. yeah so so I think it it make different set of fatty acid. Okay, thank you. And just following on from, from that, the second question in the chat is how much of the omega-3 fatty acids do you normally see under those anaerobic conditions, please? Yeah, I didn't check the omega-3 fatty acids in, in, in my experiment. I'd like to check. Thank you very much for okay. your comment. Thank you, Masami. Have we got other questions, please, either in the chat or from people putting their hands up? I'm assuming that yours is still a legacy hand, Raj, rather than a, an additional question. Just while we, we wait to see if there's, there's other questions that appear in the chat, I've got a, just a very brief question for you, Ms. Sami. When you, when you showed the wax ester production in your trailer, does the does that euglenid grow under the anaerobic conditions, or does it just hold its density at a at a at a at a at, a, at, a, at the same at the same level through the, the anaerobic condition? Does it grow anaerobically, or does it just maintain its viability? I could not catch, catch your question in late later position. Could could you? Yeah, under under the anaerobic conditions, when you were looking at the wax yes. ester production in new trepatella, uh, does it actually grow under the anaerobic conditions, or does it just sort of maintain a constant cell density, uh, just maintain its viability? Uh, yes, yeah. It holds your uterine without shaking, but um, in anaerobic condition, we brew brew the argon gas to the culture and then they, they can make wax esters. Okay. It, is, it is okay? Yep, yep. I'm not seeing any more questions in either the chat or amongst the participant list in terms of hands moving up. So, Unless there are any questions that are going to appear, then I think we've come to the end of the. I think Pika has a question. Oh, Pika, yep, please. Yeah. I would actually like the organizers because I really find this program interesting. It's really different aspects uh, and so on. So, uh, was there? How did you come up with this? And how? What is most surprising to you in this this field? How it's connected to other things and what aspects are in the last years coming up in the field because it's also really new information coming and, and different things. So um, just general question to the organizers, if I may. Okay, thank you very much, Pika. What I'm going to do is I'm going to 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 offer to to thank God in a minute who might choose to to, to speak just a little bit about what what the what he's trying to to, to build with the the Euglena network. I think you're going to I'm not going to past Neil at the moment, Neil Hall at the moment, unless he chooses to come in. But I think you're going to hear from Neil towards at the end of the afternoon, at the end of the second session, who's going to talk to you in terms about what we're hoping is going to happen in terms of wider genome sequencing projects and the biology that might be discovered. I'm going to pass to thank God in the first instance, please. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so basically, um, just I'm going to go back a bit and then uh, we should provide a context to what we're trying to achieve and the community. So I, I did my PhD in Iglina Gracilis. I, I worked with uh, Mark Field, Mark Carrington, and uh, Steve Kelly at Oxford, Cambridge, and Dundee. So I basically was fascinated about this uh, organization, as well as many other people. And 
I was fortunate to also work with many scientists here, Michael Ginger. I mean, a, a majority of people, majority of the scientists are actually here. So, but one of the things was clear in, in, in the, during my studies is that the, this organism is very fascinating. It has huge application and you know, you know translational potential, but it's understudied one. And also it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's underexploited. It does not, there's no much exploitation going on around it. So uh, one major thing here is because of the genome. So I spent quite a lot of time, you know, working with others as well, trying to get the genome sequence. And I think that is also one of the motivational factors that I also actually did reach out to Jonas to kind of come talk to us about the high fire rate because we see quite a lot happening within the community uh, in terms of, you know, the completeness of uh, applying the high fi the power, the, the power of high fi technology. So, and I think this is an area that I, I, I suspect maybe Michael, Neil, and uh, Paul Zimba would maybe begin to also think about in addition to other methods as well that you might actually uh, have. So uh, we, we think that this would help us, you know, start to think about solutions, but for that to happen, we need a community to come together and um, you know, begin to talk to each other because when, when, when the paper was published, I get lots of emails and people, you know, I get lots of emails. So one of the things I felt is through that process, I'll be able to create a platform, bringing everyone together to start talking to each other, to start looking at this. So we, we know is there's a chance we might not start seeing results in a year or two years time, but the good thing is that the community is there. There is an emailing list you know, <laughs> that goes around and people can start talking to each other. But the key thing now is with over the past one or two years has been more of awareness creation engagement. So the key, the next chapter, basically, will now be you know delivering on the key things you know, and that lies within the um, the science committee and trying to form the Euglena Genome Project. And I think this is what uh, Michael talked about that Neil might want to talk about. So I think that is the next chapter in many of many of these things, and ultimately create that connection between industry and academia and um, so that we can begin to see the benefits of the system. So I don't know, Michael, over to you, does Neil want to talk about it now or will it be way down the line later today? Neil, are you, are you wanting to say anything at the moment, Neil, or, or wanting to wait an hour and a half or so before you, before you speak? I think, I think possibly Neil is, is choosing to speak later unless he's, unless, <laughs> unless, unless he's on mute and talking because I, I can't see him in my, in my panel. And I think coming to the question from, from Neil Emery that's, that's, that's in the chat in terms of any advice for the EIN as a group in terms of what it might tackle sequencing wise as a group. Neil, if you'd like to ask that question of the other Neil after he's after he's spoken, it may well be that that that, that Neil is it answers your question when it when he talks a little bit like a little bit later on. Is is that the only thing that I'd say from 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 my end in that question that we're excited about it and we're really happy and look forward to partnering with you on this. Super, we look forward to working with you as well. Um, if there's no other questions in the chat, and I am going to flip over to the participants to see if there's any other hands that have gone up. Um, I can't see any other hands for questions at the moment. I think then we've come to the end of this first session today. We've got opportunity to either break out for tea or coffee or if people want to catch up with old friends around the screen, then they're welcome to do so. But we're going to reconvene as a group at half past four when we've got a series of five short talks. And then again, at the end of those five short talks, we'll open the screen up for questions. I've got a note to indicate that Peter Myler, who would have been chairing the second session, he's not able to join us today. So I'm afraid you're going to have me again from half past four. Um, if there's nothing more to add at this point, We'll see you all in about 25 minutes or so. Thank you very much to the first three speakers of the day to keep into time. That really, really does help us keep moving along. So thank you, everybody, for, for, for both the presentations and for questions thus far. See you in about 20, 25 minutes or so. Yep. Yeah. Again, everybody. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to the second half of today's session. We've got five short 10-minute talks. 
before again the screen's going to become available for for for, for questions um first of our speakers is michael hammond from the czech academy of sciences and michael you're going to talk to us about the flagella proteome of euglena gracilis yes yes i will i'm going to perfect. share my screen can in you your own, see in that your own time, then, michael that's perfect we've got that up i'm going to go on to mute all right great so yes, I will talk about a proteomic investigation of the flagella of Euglena gracilis. Euglena gracilis is obviously the model organism of a group of interest for this uh, presentation across the next three days, Euglenids. Like many of its kind, it is a biflagellated protist. It possesses a emergent and non-emergent flagellum named for whether they are visible outside of this invaginated cell structure referred to as the flagella pocket. So the emergent flagellum, it serves to propel the cell uh, using a spinning lasso movement, while the non-emergent flagellum tends to encircle the other and provides mechanical support. So when we typically think of flagella or the cilia, we uh, most commonly associate functions like uh, motility and movement with it. But flagella and cilia also have a wide variety of cell signaling and sensory functions seen in both unicellular and multicellular organisms. So it's no different for Euglena gracilis. Uh, it was initially presumed that the stigma, formerly called the eye spot, was the light sensitive region and responsible for coordinating light based responses but we now know that it is in fact the paraflagella body and the flagella arm itself that constitute the photosensitive region and are responsible for coordinating light-based swimming. So we've already investigated the proteomes of the mitochondrion and the plastids of Euglena gracilis, so it seemed timely to have a look at this interesting cell structure and see what secrets we could uncover. So to isolate the flagella from Euglena gracilis, we incubated cells in ice cold ethanol, and this caused these cells to take on a rounded appearance and detach the majority of their flagella. You can see a fairly visible flagella here uh, that's gone once you've incubated them and that can be collected easily via centrifugation. We were also interested for comparative purposes to have a pellicle proteome, which is the strips that surround the microtubule corset. And this was isolated using sucrose gradient fractionation. And thirdly, we wanted a whole cell lysate from which we could compare protein enrichment in the flagella. So this was also collected via sonification and centrifugation of cell pellets. So all three of these fractions were subject to trypsin digest and mass spectrometry analysis. And what this generated was a series of just under 5,000 protein groups uh, between these three categories. And a total of 1,684 of these protein groups were found to be enriched in the flagella uh, compared to the whole cell lysate. And as you see here, 1,397 were found to be unique. Uh, we define this exclusive localization as having 100-fold enrichment or greater. Surprisingly little overlap with the pellicle region as well. And when you compare the volcano plots of the flagella fraction, we see a high degree of purity with only a few constituents uh, traditionally found in other organelles, which suggests that we can be fairly confident that this is a genuine proteome of the flagella of Euglena gracilis. So when you compare this with other flagella proteomes of other organisms, one thing that stands out about it is its size. It is in fact only eclipsed in raw proteomic quantity um, or variety by the cilia of the photoreceptors of mus musculus, as well as a succession of proteomic studies on the flagella of Trypanosoma brucei. So one thing this uh, foregrounds is that protist flagella, they're not simple, they're not boring and not worth uh, people's time. They are complex and dynamic, and they're just as exciting potentially as those that you see in their multicellular peers. So using this proteomic data, 
we wanted to investigate some of the cell sensory pathways coordinated through the flagella. So as I mentioned before, the flagella can coordinate a number of light-based responses called photomovement and phototaxis. It can additionally coordinate gravitaxis, which ensures that the cell is always swimming against the gravity column. Uh, I think they sent Euglena gracilis up into space at one point to study this in a shuttle. Uh, but even without illumination or a gravity to swim against, uh, the cells will still swim. So you have a series of proteins also coordinating free swimming. And some of these proteins have been characterized. Other steps are yet to be. So it looks like this rather complicated pathway. Uh, but very generally, you have protein kinases, which phosphorylate flagella motor proteins, stimulating flagella movement. These protein kinases are stimulated by cyclic AMP, which is generated by adenylate cyclases, and these are stimulated by environmental factors or other cell molecular components. So using our proteomic data, um, unsurprisingly, we found that most of these components are enriched and present in the flagella, while certain signaling pathways like gravitaxis begin uh, outside the flagella. And this is in accordance with what has been observed in calcium assays. They find that you get a calcium assay mediating gravitaxis from just below the flagella pocket, which then stimulates calmodulin 2 with another protein to bind to an unknown adenylate cyclase, which generates CAMP, stimulating uh, protein kinase A. So some of these proteins, um, the specific uh, identity has not been elucidated, but we just know the protein group that's mediating this function. So accordingly, we went and identified uh, groups that were enriched in the flagellum as candidates to be fulfilling this process, awaiting further characterization. Um, we also identify a number of other hypothetical functional proteins, and these include sets of PAC-like proteins, which stands for photoactivated adenylate cyclase, which are coordinating light-based responses that we specifically know are not being coordinated by this PAC alpha and beta complex here. We find uh, a transient receptor potential pore, rather like the one mediating calcium influx with some unknown role on the flagella specifically and a group of calmodulins. So the conclusion here is that we have a number of interesting protein candidates that await further functional characterization. So moving to flagella metabolism, the flagella of all organisms are defined by a need for ATP, which is made difficult by their length and volume restraints. So they can respond by either channeling a bunch of energy shuttles or localizing certain steps of glycolysis in the flagella. So in Euglena gracilis, we found nine adenylate kinases, which serve as these ATP shuttles transporting ATP to the flagella, as well as four nucleoside diphosphate kinases, which serve to maintain ATP homeostasis. Interestingly, we also found the full glycolysis pathway within the flagella, um, this stands in contrast to other protists like Chlamydominus reinhardti, which only localize the uh, three N steps um, to get two ATP generated per pathway. The only other organism that is known to localize the whole glycolysis pathway is that seen in the sperm tails of Mus musculus. Uh, and this prompts interesting but unresolved speculation as to why Euclid gracilis is going to the trouble of this whole pathway. Another interesting factor is that this fructose biphosphate aldolase that you see here is distinct from what you find in the cytosol and the green algal plastid. It is of red algal origin and it was imparted, argued for in the chrome alveolar hypothesis that the common ancestor to many photosynthetic algae had a transient red algal ancestor imparting certain genes, some of which are still seen today. Also argued for in the shopping bag hypothesis about the Euglena genomes being a mosaic. Um, and I bring this up as being a very interesting example of protein retargeting uh, distinct from the cytoplasm and the green algal plastids. 
We additionally find major subunits of the proteasomes uh, in cell in vertebrate cilia. This is involved in specialized signaling processing, and it's likely to be involved in similar processes within euclenids as well. Um, so I'll conclude by saying this proteomic investigation has demonstrated the enormous complexity of euclenid flagella. Um, this is uh, building on established work that uh, suggests that euglenid, uh, uh, in addition to flagella of other organisms, are of one kind, as you would expect, of the uh, structure inherited from the last common eukaryotic ancestor. Um, we have a number of people to thank. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll just wrap it up here. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Michael. That's perfect and perfectly to time. Um, we're going to move quickly from one speaker to the next. So if you could stop sharing, please, Michael and Kazuharu Arakawa from Keio University in Tokyo is our next speaker. And you're going to talk to us about genome sequencing of Euglena gracilis strain Z and base J calling. And in your yes, own, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you, time. Maris, for giving me the opportunity to talk in this uh, symposium uh, to talk about some of our progress in the genome sequencing approaches. So my main uh, work of organism is actually uh, not Euglena. We, I mostly work on uh, species called tardigrades and uh, spiders, but we do a lot of sequencing. Uh, for example, we've recently uh, completed the sequencing 1,000 spiders. And uh, with that, uh, we've uh, also worked on many other different um, interesting organisms like Euglena. In this one, we are in collaboration with uh, Professor Ishikawa of Shimane University. So um, we've initially worked on uh, Euglena with the transcriptome approach uh, back in 2016, where we firstly identified the um, putative enzymes that uh, might function as a problem synthase through bioinformatics screening of the transcriptome. And we followed up with the experimental approach to actually pinpoint um, that one of our candidates was actually uh, working and functioning uh, in Euglena as the uh, glucan synthase, which is responsible for the pheromone synthesis, synthesis in Euglena gracilis. But um, with, even with the information of the transcriptome, um, it is really fundamental to have a fine um, reference genome to do any kind of molecular biology analysis so uh, we started uh, working on doing the genome sequencing of Euglena, but as this paper by Dr. Ebenezer really uh, represents, sequencing of the uh, Euglena genome is really difficult even with this um, advanced uh, sequencing technologies in the current era. So one of the trouble was uh, obviously the contiguity of the assembly. Uh, I think it's mostly due to the repetitive regions and also the existence of base J as has been uh, demonstrated, I mean, discussed in the previous session. But also, it's also the annotation part where the completeness of the genome has remained very low um, with the sigma or BASCO kind of um, completeness measures. So, there are many other different uh, weird features of the, the Euglena genome, like the extra chromosomal, uh, ribosomal, um, megaplasmic kind of thing, and a lot of uh, fragmentation that are observed in the 20S uh, ribosomal DNA, or very fragmented uh, form of mitochondrial DNA, or um, the existence of uh, extensive non canonical splicing uh, within the genome. And obviously, the existence of, existence of the, the uh, base J, which is the hypermodified form of the uh, thymidine um, base. So we initially started the project in 2017, uh, right after we've sequenced the uh, transcriptome um, by using the synthetic long release um, of the Illumina sequencing using the 10x genomics uh, platform. And we've uh, managed to assemble a uh, very fragmented genome um, covering up to about 800 megabases, and the BASCO score, which measures the completeness of the genome, remained very low, um, as shown by the work by Dr. Ebenezer. And we eventually moved to the uh, Nanopore platform to have a more contiguous assembly. And we've um, 
had a progress by um, combining the nanopore sequencing as well as the uh, 10x genome um, Illumina long, synthetic long reads. And uh, recently, um, last year, we managed to uh, assemble the genome up to uh, one gigabase. And the um, sequence N50 length uh, has gone up to 100 kilobase pairs. This is not necessarily the greatest genome, um, but I think it has a decent contiguity to um, work as a, as a draft, first draft genome to study the Euclidean uh, graph status. And the interesting thing is, while the um, completeness remains very low uh, using um, the BASCO or the SIGMA, um, the benchmarking tools, the mapping rate of the genome sequencing from our 10x reads and also the um, different um, the sequencing done by Dr. Ebenezer, uh, so this is a different um, location of sequencing, has uh, been very high. So many of the genomic reads are almost completely uh, being mapped to our reference genome. So I think we have a very complete um, DNA coverage in terms of the genomic um, sequences, but the annotation remains very low. And this is partly because the conventional gene prediction software like Augustus or GeneMark, which is used as part of the um, BASCO um, benchmarking software or the breaker kind of um, annotation tools cannot really identify the uh, non-conventional splicing sites uh, that, are pres that are present in the Euclidean genome. So we have turned to a more conventional approach to do the annotation of the Euclidean genome, where we've combined um, four available transcriptome data of Euclidean gracilis, as well as a new um, genome-guided transcriptome assembly, uh, because we have a new data on RNA-seq as well, which um, has as much as um, 80 different uh, data sets. And we mapped those into the genome and did a genome-guided assembly. And we've merged those all five uh, different transcriptome assemblies to uh, make a full complete set of um, Euglena transcriptome. And then again, um, predicted the protein coding regions from those transcriptome assembly and mapped those back onto the genome to the um, gene annotations. So this was very old school approach, uh, which has been taken um, in the very early areas of genomic uh, sequencing. But this uh, approach was actually quite successful which raised the uh, completeness up to um, almost 95%. So this is now a very complete annotation uh, with, well, moderately um, assembled contiguous uh, genome. And very surprisingly, um, the non-conventional splicing site seems to be very um, largely uh, shared within the genome. So this is the distribution of the splicing sites um, as shown by our um, annotation approach and the uh, conventional GTAG canonical splicing sites uh, only comprise 22%, which is extremely low compared to other uh, vertebrates or invertebrates or other any other organisms. So we've uh, went on to uh, also identify the base J. Since we are using the nanopore sequencing, nanopore sequencing can detect uh, different base modifications by different signals uh, that are um, detected by when the DNA uh, goes through the nanopores. And there are several approaches to identify the new modifications, but we've taken the comparison approach, which compares the uh, modified signal with a reference signal, which uh, is made by taking out all of the modifications from the genome. So we personally amplified the genomic DNA using um, isosomal uh, multiple displacement amplification, which um, takes out all of the uh, modifications within the genome. And we've sequenced that with the nanopore and compared the signals of the mo uh, modification less genome and the uh, modified genome. And that will uh, allow us to map each of the uh, base um, with the percentage of the available modifications. And uh, this shows that there are actually a lot of uh, themes uh, which are modified um, at 90% of the reads. So Calculating all of those uh, modifications, it shows that the base J modification could possibly um, exist uh, in 1.2% of the genome, but this is not quite uh, too, too many uh, com in comparison to the previously reported number, which is only uh, 0.2 more percent. 
But the distribution itself uh, seems to be very uniformly distributed, which agrees with this paper. And the um, modification does not necessarily um, localize in the uh, telomeric regions. So one of the motives we've obtained was the reverse region, um, and that really some of the regions in the triplet uh, timing uh, really shows the high modification rate over here. So I think we are being able to capture the sequence, but we uh, also still have many uh, false positives. So we are trying to now uh, knock down the J binding proteins, which are identified through the genome sequences, and try to pinpoint the uh, modified J bases by um, similar approaches using the nanopore sequencing. So we've um, managed to um, assemble a draft genome sequence, and we did a, a very conventional technique to annotate the genome, and we now have a VASCO score um, above 94%. And we are happy to share our, our uh, genome to the community so that we can make a very nice study um, out of this. So uh, if anybody is um, interested, I'm really happy to uh, share it and uh, write a good paper um, about the uh, Euglena uh, with this data set. So I think the time is up. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That's lovely. If you'd like to stop sharing in your own yes. time, please. Um, I've noticed as the one or two questions have come in the chat during the, the, the last two talks, we'll turn to those questions when we when we, we go to the question session at the at the at the, at the end of the at the at the end of the five presentations. So thank you very much, Kazaharu. Um, our third speaker is Pavel Halakuk from the University of Warsaw in Poland. And you're going to talk to us around the canonical and non-conventional introns in euglena genomes? Uh, yes, exactly. And I think my talk will be a great follow-up for the one we just had. I think so. Well, uh, I hope so too. So please, in your own time. Yeah. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pavel. I'm a PhD student at the University of Warsaw. Oh, and first of all, uh, I think I will be the first person to say that I'm interested in this genome of Euclidean gracilis uh, that was just presented. So uh, ju just to say that. Uh, and uh, right now, I am very happy to be able to share with you the first uh, results coming from our intern projects. Uh, so as uh, some of you may know, Euglenes have a number of unusual, unusual uh, biological features. And among them, we are particularly interested in their introns. So when we take a look in Euglenes genomes, we can find two types of introns. One are uh, so-called conventional or uh, canonical introns, which uh, are typical for uh, almost all, all eukaryotes. They have conserved splice sites, uh, polypyrimidine tracts, and they are removed from the transcript uh, by the splicer also. On the other hand, we have so-called non-conventional introns, which are nothing like the first one. They don't have any conserved motifs in the splice sites, uh, but they often have short lipids in there, which makes work with them even more difficult. Um, there have been uh, several motifs and uh, structures described uh, near uh, intron uh, borders, which brings uh, the ends of the intron uh, closer together. We don't know yet how are they uh, removed, but they are definitely spliced out from the transcript in different physical form than uh, conventional introns. So we know that they are something else. And another interesting thing about them is that uh, while uh, we uh, observe canonical introns in the same uh, positions, in the same genes between species, uh, this uh, pattern is much more random in case of non-conventional introns, uh, kind of similar to uh, mobile genetic elements. Mm, and the main goal of our project is to characterize these, uh, those non-commercial introns mostly in homologous genes of free urina species uh, in the genomic scale, not just few genes how it was done before, but uh, on the scale of the whole genome. Uh, and it requires, of course, genomes and genes in which we can describe non-commercial introns and use this knowledge to better uh, predict uh, genes uh, in urina genomes. So uh, you, of course, need to start with the genomes. Because of the uh, large size of urina nuclear genome, we used hybrid approach with both uh, short and uh, long reads. Uh, and uh, um, short reads have been assembled using spades. And later, space contexts have been scaffolded by uh, pack bio reads. And those scaffolds, in turn, have been scaffolded by transcriptome reads. And it allowed us to achieve quite, uh, quite reasonable, reasonable uh, context or sort of the scaffolds 
which we hope that we'll be able to predict some, some genes in, in those. Um, but this was also difficult. And the thing that helped us the most was using uh, transcript-oriented RNA circuits instead of normal unoriented reads. But even then, the results for the genomes are not really as good as we hoped for, uh, based on the um, like, uh, what we know that what is in euglena transcriptome. Uh, so we thought that it's mostly due to uh, either uh, our genome is too fragmented that we cannot uh, have uh, whole uh, gene sequences within, within we, uh, in one uh, scaffold, or uh, there is a problem with uh, non-commercial introns. And uh, we tried to analyze those introns that uh, were present in those genes we, are, we predicted, but uh, they could, like, the genes in general were uh, not good enough to uh, obtain uh, good introns from them. And it's because we didn't know how those introns look like. So it was kind of a, a chicken and egg problem that we needed introns to describe genes, but we needed the genes to describe introns. So instead of that, we decided to manually annotate a few hundred introns to, to better understand how they look like in different genes, not just in, in uh, highly conserved genes which were studied before. Um, to do so, we uh, uh, needed some gene set and uh, we decided that uh, Boost Cortolox is a great starting point. So we took uh, gene sequences and uh, transcript sequences uh, corresponding to the same uh, Boost Cortolox uh, and uh, extracted them in our uh, homemade pipeline, uh, uh, aligned them and manually annotated. So we are able to uh, extract uh, for all uh, three genomes, uh, 50, 57, uh, for 57 Busco orthologs, we are able to get uh, gene from each, uh, from each species. But from those only 34 were kept after we, we looked at them. But anyway, we had over 900 exons and 800 introns of really uh, good quality. Like we know uh, which intron is which type and so on. So we took a closer look at those introns and there is nothing really surprising uh, with conventional introns. We in general know how they look like. So it wasn't a big surprise to us. But in case of conventional introns, we found out that uh, the motifs like CAG and CTG here, we believed are strong indicators of the let's say non-commerciality of the intron, they are not as clearly visible as we thought before. And we checked a number of different statistics like uh, intron's average length, GC content, uh, presence of polymer reading tract. And uh, however, the strongest marker of uh, non-commercial intron remains this uh, uh, characteristic pairing with uh, plus two shift, which means that fourth nucleotide of the exon uh, pairs with the sixth from the end, fifth with the seventh and so on. Mm, and we use this to, to better describe interest, but in demand. Uh, another interesting thing we observed is that uh, exons in Euglena genomes, they are relatively short. Like average uh, exon is just over 100 nucleotides. So it means that major, uh, a lot of uh, exons are even shorter than that. And the shortest exon we observed was just 12 nucleotides. And it makes automatic uh, annotation of, of such exon very difficult. So, uh, having these informations, we uh, uh, decided to um, uh, prepare a new algorithm for uh, class, uh, intron uh, cl classification. Uh, we use just splice sites for canonical introns and this uh, secondary structure for non canonical introns. Of course, there are introns which have both of them, and those are for uh, now, let's say they are intermediate introns. And based on those two features, we are able to really good. Uh, to predict whether intron is canonical really good, which is not a surprise, but we also got uh, really nice results for non-commercial introns. And uh, while those are not still perfect because we uh, by we falsely annotate 20% of non not non-commercial introns as non-conventional, so it's not uh, perfect yet, but it's much, much better than anything we had before. So we took this to the uh, scale of whole genomes. And as you can see, when we go from a manual annotation to the automatic annotation of Busco genes, it gets a bit worse. But when we go to the uh, whole genomes, uh, we are able to more or less annotate 80%. And this 80% of uh, almost 2 million introns we analyzed. So it's not just the best genes or whatever. We, we are able to really uh, classify majority of the of the introns in the in genomes, and that's that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And we believe that it will allow us to better understand uh, genomes in general. 
Another thing I want to mention, uh, I still have a bit of time, is that uh, the results from the Busco genes that uh, exons uh, are relatively short. Uh, this picture is uh, visible also in, uh, in scale of the whole genome. So in general, uh, Unit genomes have relatively short exons, so it will make any uh, genomic or transcriptomic work with them uh, very, very challenging. And uh, it's really difficult to annotate very short exons without knowing what uh, kind of nucleotides can be on uh, intron exon borders. Mm -hmm. So, to sum up, we now have over 400 uh, high quality non canonical introns, which we'll use to further uh, refine our uh, classifier. And for now, it seems that secondary structure is the, the, the most crucial part of non functional intron. Uh, Euglena genomes uh, have very short exons, and you have to keep that in mind when you, when you work with, uh, with them. Uh, and we believe that based on our results uh, for non mechanical introns, and if we uh, define our gene set a bit, we'll be able to uh, tell you more about, about how to predict genes in Euclidean genomes and uh, how this evolution of non-conventional uh, introns looks, looks like in uh, Euclidean genomes. Uh, so I'd like to thank fund, the funding agencies, all members of my teams, of, and of course uh, to Euclidean International Network for having me here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pavel. That's perfect and perfectly timed. Again, if you could top, stop sharing in your own time, please. And we're going to move swiftly on to our fourth speaker, who is Victoria Kennedy from Trent University in Canada. And I'm hoping you're going to talk to us about the influence of nitrogen and sulfur on euglena gene expression. Yes, that seems to be the plan for today. So if you'd like to share screen in your own time, please. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And as mentioned, yes, so my name is Victoria Kennedy. I am a master's student at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, in Canada. I'm going to talk to you about the research that's kind of encompassed my entire master's, which is the enhanced euglena gracilis cadmium tolerance using elevated levels of sulfur and nitrogen. So just a bit of background on euglena species and metal binding compounds. So back in 2003, Avila et al discovered that a pretreatment with mercury chloride actually increased the euglena gracilis cells tolerance to cadmium chloride. And this research was later on expanded by other groups. So Winters et al. in 2018 actually used a dried euglena biomass to bind metals, and they performed a metabolomic analysis that identified specific metal binding compounds. And these compounds included polyphenols and lignin monomers, and they were believed that this could potentially alter the lignin and amine biosynthesis pathways. And these compounds are rich in nitrogen and sulfur, which led to the overall hypothesis that altering nitrogen or sulfur could potentially influence these metal binding compounds that are being produced. The specific hypothesis for my master's was that growing euglena gracilis in increased nitrogen and sulfur will increase the amount of metal binding compounds that it produces and thereby enhance its cadmium tolerance. So I had two specific research objectives to answer these questions. The first objective was to pretreat euglena gracilis separately with nitrogen and sulfur and then challenge it with cadmium in order to assess its tolerance to the metal. The second objective was to identify potential genes that could be encoding for metal binding compounds, and this will be done using RNA sequencing. So the first step was to select the excess sulfur and nitrogen sources to grow up euglena gracilis. So I chose magnesium sulfate heptahydrate as it's already found in the base level modified acid media that we use to grow euglena gracilis. And what I have here is just a snapshot a snapshot of these cells after eight days exposed to this increased level of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. So as you can see, zero times is what was naturally occurring in the media already, so about six millimolar, and I increased it all the way up to 120 millimolar. And what we saw that morphologically, there was no change in the cells. They morphologically maintained their shape, maintained their color, indicating that there was no morphological change as a result of the exposure to magnesium sulfate. I performed the same initial experiment with using ammonium nitrate as the excess nitrogen source. So the base level of nitrogen in the modified acid is about eight millimolar. I increased it all the way up to 151 millimolar. And what we found here is that after prolonged exposure, so about 10 days in exposed to the 20 times or 150 millimolar ammonium nitrate, you can actually see the cell morphologically begin to change. It's no longer maintaining its shape. It's actually becoming discolored, taking on a more brown hue as opposed to the green that we're all used to seeing. 
So this led to us going a step down and selecting the 10 times ammonium nitrate. As you can see, there was some stress morphologically, the cell is changing. However, based on my next data, it was actually still able to grow. So the next step was to determine long-term the impact of these pretreatments on the euglena cells. So as you can see here is over a period of 66 days, there was no significant difference between the growth rate of the non-pretreated cells versus the sulfur and the nitrogen, indicating that long-term, these pretreatments were not negatively impacting how the cells were able to grow. So this led to the my, my kind of main experiment, which was the cadmium challenge of pretreated and non-pretreated euglena bacillus cells. So just to walk you through how I set this experiment up, I started by growing a stock culture of the euglena bacillus cells in modified acid media. I then split these into non-pretreated, so just cells grown in modified acid media, sulfur pretreated, pre -treated, which was modified acid media with excess sulfur, and nitrogen pretreated, which is cells grown in modified acid media plus excess nitrogen. They were grown for a period of 45 days and transferred every four days. And then I split this off into cells that were then exposed to cadmium, so 25 micromolar cadmium, or cells that were grown just in the modified acid media and not exposed to cadmium. And what we saw was actually quite interesting. So what this graph shows is that after a period of eight days being transferred every four days, that the sulfur pretreated cells had statistically higher numbers of viable cells left in their culture along with the nitrogen pretreated cells. So that blue bar there. So there's statistically higher numbers of viable cells in the culture when compared back to the non-pretreated or just cells grown in modified acid media, indicating that these pretreatments did have effect on overall cell viability. And to assess cell viability, I stained the cells with trypan blue. So as you can see here on the left, we have cells grown in modified acid media plus sulfur plus nitrogen. So these are in zero micromolar cadmium. None of the cells are stained with trypan blue, indicating that all the cells in the culture are viable. However, when we get to 25 micromolar cadmium chloride, you can see that the cells grown in modified acid media, we actually start to see cells dying off. They're no longer viable. They're being stained blue by the trypan blue. And this trend continued for that second transfer. So that eight days in growth, all the cells that were grown in zero micromolar cadmium actually were all remaining viable. Whereas the cells, if you look at in 25 micromolar cadmium chloride, the cells that were not pretreated at all continued to have cell deaths. More cells were being stained blue with the trypan, indicating that we were losing more viable cells. And this also did start to happen with the ammonium nitrated pretreated cells, but the rate was significantly slower. There were significantly fewer. Um, non-viable cells when compared back to the cells only grown in modified acid media. So that takes care of the first research objective, indicating that these pretreatments are having an impact on the overall tolerance of euglena bacillus to cadmium. So the next objective was to identify potential genes that could be encoding for these metal binding compounds. And for that, I'm using RNA sequencing. So RNA sequencing, I went through essentially three major steps to get to where I got to get to the data. So the first step was to culture euglena bacillus cells, both pretreated, non-pretreated, exposed to cadmium, and those cells that were not exposed to cadmium. I then used a trisol RNA isolation method to isolate the total RNA from the cultures. And then prior to sending it for the, to the Center of Applied Genomics for sequencing, I checked the quality of the RNA. So I wanna draw your attention to this specific gel here. So as we've already heard today is that the um, euglena bacillus is quite unique in the sense that its large ribosome subunit, its 20S, is actually fragmented into about 14 different pieces. So that was Matt Savayal just recently in 2020 published their paper on this. And this gel does show that. So as you can see, that top asterisk there is supposed to be where ideally in a eukaryotic organism, you would find a 28S band or your large subunit band. And then the second asterisk is for where you would find the 18S fragment. And as you can see, we while we do have some indication that there is an 18S there and it is in the correct location, we don't typically have that distinct 28S peak. So that led to some issues specifically when using a bioanalyzer to determine quality of the RNA. So as you can see here on the left, you have the bioanalyzer results for a mouse and they, this technique gives you what they call an RNA integrity number. So they just said that this is an RNA integrity number of 9.5 high quality because you have that ratio of 28S to 18S and it's about two times. However, because we have in euglena gracilis a fragmented large subunit, if you can look on the right here, this is my specific RNA that I sent off. It was actually only scored, scored as an RNA integrity number of five. And this is because we lack that sharp, distinct 28S peak that's complete. Therefore, it could not use the proper ratios in order to determine whether or not the RNA was of high quality. 
So we had to move on to using the DV200 index, so a percentage of fragments that are over 200 nucleotides and considered to be a better metric for assessing the quality of RNA and the high DV200 is an indicator of efficient library production. So for that, they consider anything, any percentage above 70 is considered good quality RNA. So I'll draw your attention to the overall results here. So this is the same sample I showed you on the last slide. So the RNA, re RNA integrity number was five. However, if you look at the DV200 in the red box there, it's actually 90%. So while the RNA integrity number was not considered, would not have called this good quality RNA, the DV200 actually told us the opposite which was further confirmed when I actually did the per sequence quality score for this particular sample. As you can see, the per sequence quality score on average was about, the FRED score was 36. And you can again that these sequences I also generated from the sample were high quality in the library preparation. So this led to the kind of major part of what we all love about this organism is that since we do not have a reference genome, we have to rely on other methods, indicating specifically a de novo transcriptome assembly. So I used Trinity for this method. So it breaks it down to kind of two phases. The first phase is the clustering of RNA-seq reads, with the second phase being the assembling of the clustered clusters of reads. So these are kind of the relevant statistics from both Trinity as well as Busco that I ran. So the total transcripts is 838,537 transcripts, with the N50 value being 892 for all transcript contigs. And it searched about 255 Busco groups and found 211 complete Buscos, so about 82.8% complete Buscos. So future experiments, I actually recently just finished this step, which is mapping the reads to the assembled transcriptome. I recently just finished the alignments for that. They finished about like two days ago. So I have yet to really sift through that data yet. Uh, my goal is to identify differential transcript levels and potentially use and use reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR to confirm transcript level changes. I've already got housekeeping genes tested and selected for this method, as well as finalizing it with a go enrichment analysis. And while I have my last 10 seconds here, I want to bring your ideas up to the big picture of this project, which is that using the RNA sequencing go enrichment analysis, we can potentially determine if any transcripts are relevant in sulfur and nitrogen metabolism in euglena gracilis. And if so, are any of these transcripts relevant to the production of these metal binding compounds that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. That was great. We are going to move to our last speaker for this afternoon, Malika Chabi from Fighter Systems in Belgium. And I think, are you going to talk to us about mutant analysis to study oxygenic photosynthesis in Euglena gracilis? Thank you. Yeah. And if you'd like to share screen in your own time, if that's what you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Malika Shabi. I will present our ongoing work on the tile molecular dissection of the oxygenic photosynthesis mechanism in Galena gracilis through mutant analysis. This work is mostly carried out by Gwenael Gain and Marcello Matsudo. Oxygenic photosynthesis is performed by cyanobacteria, archaeoplastida, and some microorganisms derived from uh, secondary endosymbiosis. It appears in eukaryotes thanks to the primary endosymbiosis and spread on Earth through secondary endosymbiosis. If the global reaction of the photosynthesis remains the same, Differences are accumulated between the photosynthetic organi uh, organisms in response to their environment. From the cyanobacteria to the most primitive phylum containing chloroplasts like Eglena, differences can be observed at their photoprotective mechanism, their uh, inorganic carbon acquisition, or at their life harvesting process. Photosynthesis is a complex machinery which takes place at, uh, at the chloroplast, more precisely at thylakoid membrane, where photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 are embedded. Photosystem 1 and 2 balances their light energy distribution absorbed by their light harvesting complex through state, uh, state transition. 
and meet the cellular uh, demand in uh, energy and reducing power through photosynthetic electron transfer chain, including both uh, linear and cyclic electron flow. To maintain the maximum photosynthetic performance and to avoid uh, photo damage. If this is how it works in plant and green algae, a green aggressive seems to, to adopt another strategy. Indeed, uh, Deutsch and collaborators have already reported that there is an unlike chlorophyll uh, fluorescence in Aglina gracilis. The same observation is confirmed by our work in the lab, in which we make evidence of the um, presence of an atypic antenna used for uh, state transition in Aglina gracilis. For more detail about this, I invite you to follow Felix Begadaluna's presentation. On the other hand, the recently published work in, uh, in our lab reports that Eglina gracilis uses the energetic uh, coupling between chloroplast and mitochondria instead of the cyclic electron flow to feed uh, its cell energetic needs. So in order to desiccate these differences and understand the molecular functioning of the photosynthesis, we generate a library of uh, 115 stable transformants of Aglina gracilis. Aglina is known to resist numerous antibiotics among the 20 among the 22 uh, antibiotic tested, only three of them show an effect on Aglina gracilis. Uh, they are streptomycin, spectinomycin, and cyclohexamide. Uh, streptomycin is known to inhibit uh, chloroplastic protein translation. As you can see here, uh, Aglena gracilis uh, cell patches grown on uh, minimum mineral media supplied with acetate or, or not, uh, the cells are uh, green. But uh, the addition of the streptomycin in both uh, media uh, cause loss of the um, chloroplast and cell uh, bleaching. We observed the same effect on the cell uh, grown in uh, liquid media. This was a very useful screen to, uh, to uh, the mutants. A plasmid containing the resistance gene for streptomycin is available for Chlamydomonas urinary which um, shows a codon use, usage quite similar than uh, Aglina gracilis. Cell ground in uh, minimum uh, media with acetate were uh, electroporated with streptomycin uh, resistance cassette. Three weeks later, colonies of Aglina appeared. Then we confirmed the by uh, PCR and sequencing the presence of the cassette in the mutant uh, genome. We evaluated the growth of 23 randomly selected uh, transformants as the cell density reached after 10 days in liquid mineral media supplied with acetate, acetate in uh, comparison to the wild type strain. As shown in this diagram, some transformants presented a much uh, lower cell density, while others were not significantly uh, different from the wild type strain. We also measured the relative uh, electron transport rate of the photosystem 2, and we see clearly that uh, for some mutants it is much lower than uh, the wild type uh, strain. We then choose six mutants and evaluate their photosynthetic activity with more details using wild type strain as a reference. We perform all the measurement at the same chlorophyll concentration for all the strains. 
we have three mutant strains, 11, 12, and 13, which present a lower quantum yield of photosynthesis, photosynthesis photosystem 2, comparing to the wild type strain. And three others uh, showing the same value, or the same value than the in the wild type. This correlates with the results obtained for the active photosystem 2 measured. We also calculated the photosystem 2 for. As I said before, we use the random transformation to get the mutants. So our current goal is to locate the cassette and identify the gene impacted. To do that, we are using the nanopore technology with the Cas9 sequencing kit. After genomic DNA extraction, five prime ends are dephosphorylated. We add Cas9 ribonucleoprotein particles to the dephosphorylated genomic DNA and um, clear the region of interest. All of the DNA in the sample is DA tiled, which uh, prepares the plant of the blunt end for uh, sequencing adapter relocation. Uh, the subsequent library uh, preparation is ready to, to be sequenced. To conclude, we developed a successful metagenesis protocol based on random transformation. We selected 115 transformants. Some of them are impacted in uh, photosynthesis. We got a higher div diversity of transformants phenotypes. We, are, we characterized mutant strains affected in uh, antenna or in state transition like process. We are currently using nanopore sequencing technology to locate the cassette. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Malika. I, if, you, if you stop sharing it in your own time. Now we've moved through the five short talks. I don't know how many of you wish to take your mute off and join me in the conventional way with a round of applause and how many of you prefer to use the electronic clap that was within Zoom. But thank you very much to the five short speakers and also the speakers before the, the, before the coffee break for a series of wonderful talks and all for keeping to time. Thank you very much. In terms of moving through questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move through the questions as they appeared in the chat and offer those questions to the people that gave the talks. When we get to the end of the chat questions, then I'll ask if there's anybody that has got any further questions that they would like to ask. So in terms of the first question that came, it's to Michael Hammond from, from Kevin Tyler. And did you consider using differential centrifugation to try and separate large and small flagella? How much of the flamella, flagella membrane do you think remains associated with your preps? And are the basal bodies still associated within those preps? And what proportion of flagella have them? So a series of questions from Kevin to you, please, Michael. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, differential centrifugation to separate the two flagella types would be an excellent follow-up study. Uh, we know of some of the unique proteins to the emergent flagellum, like paraflagella rod proteins and some of the photoactivated adenylate cyclases, but we don't know of any unique ones to the non-emergent flagellum. Um, how much of the flagellar membrane is associated? Uh, we used fairly mild extraction conditions and we recovered a number of proteins with transmembrane domains and a lot of the more sensitive protein apparatus within the flagella. Uh, so suggesting that this is an intact uh, flagella membrane. Uh, the flip side to this, however, is that basal bodies were not recovered so readily. Um, we got a few of them enriched, but not nowhere near the majority. So what proportion of flagella have their basal bodies when they detach? 
uh, the minority. And if you wanted to isolate the basal bodies, I think you'd need harsher extraction conditions. Okay, thanks, Michael. Following on from that, a question from Yafan. Um, could you tell the difference of any flagella proteins between your results and other heterotrophic euglenoids? Um, unfortunately, there have not been any flagella proteomic surveys in heterotrophic uh, euglenoids, uh, but with Alastair's follow-up comment, yes, I heartily welcome investigations to allow comparative investigations. I would most like to see Rhabdomonas castata, which I know Vladimir Hampel is culturing and we now have a transcriptome for this. Uh, that would be perhaps the most interesting for a flagella comparison. Um, we also have Euglena longa, but given its relatively close relationship with Euglena gracilis and it, it, being, uh, it having lost its ability to photosynthesize somewhat recently, it would be less ideal, even if it grows a bit better. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. I'm going to turn now to Kasaharu. There's a question for you here from Neil Hall. Could you talk on the on the on the the the, the oh, policy of the genome based on the assembly that you've generated? I guess if you kind of answered that question for for for, for Neil in the context that you're very interested to hear from people that would want to to, to look at the genome sequence that you've generated. Yes, exactly. So I like to share the uh, genome in the collaboration base. So if I share the genome and you use it for a very, you know, the genome as an important part of your project, I'll ask you to uh, include me as the collaborator, but I'm happy to share it for any purposes. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to stay with you for the next couple of questions. The two proteins that you identified as J binding proteins. Um, do they specifically bind to base J? Or yeah, so the these uh, these proteins are initially found in the trypanosoma um, as the uh, thymidine um, hydroxylase, which is the initial process of the modification of base J. So uh, the hydroxylation is the first process, and the glycosylation is the second process. So it's the initial process. And the knockout of those two genes in trypanosoma uh, completely eliminated the uh, base gene modification. So I think the same thing would happen in the euglena since these are the homologs of those genes. But even if the, these, these genes uh, didn't completely eliminate the base gene modification, we can use uh, like the immunoprotization analysis to actually see if these um, genes are binding to the base J in euglena. And then, thank you. And I'm staying with you again, another question or another series of questions. How did you deal with the DNA repeats within the genome? And did you use only nanopore sequencing reads for the assembly? And if so, what about high error rates? Are you able to, to comment on those questions, please? Yeah, so the error rate is becoming uh, quite nice uh, in the very recent um, base color, like the Bonito, uh, which the error is only like one or 2%. And we are now only using the nanopore for the assembly part, and we use the Illumina to correct the uh, errors um, as a polishing. So I think we, we are covering uh, a lot of the repeats. Okay, thank you. Have you tried to see if your detection works on smaller, better understood genomes for base J, uh, trypanosome and leishmania genomes? Oh, no, I haven't. But I think since we're using the homologs for those uh, hydroxylases, I think it's enough to uh, work on the Euglena to detect the base J here. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to Victoria, please. And we've got a question from Raj. Which housekeeping genes have you selected for your qPCR? So I started off with about seven different ones. So I started off with, I tested out GAP-DH. So GAP-DH, 18S, both actin, alpha tubulin, EF1, so the ligation factor one and PSBO. So I tested all those. I ran them, I amplified them in qPCR and ran them through the best keeper algorithm. So that program there and narrowed it down to essentially two, which is elongation factor one and actin are the two that it said would be complementary to each other and the best to move forward with for qPCR. Okay, thank you, Victoria. That's lovely. I'm going to turn to Malika, and we've got a question with regard to why were quantum yields low, please? I think Malika is on mute. You're on mute, yes. 
sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it's known um, for for a glena gracilis to to have a quantum yields, uh, very low quantum quantum yield. It, uh, it's always like this. We, we don't know the reason exactly why, but uh, that's what. Uh, that's what happens. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to turn back to Michael, please. The ATP um, that's that, that, does ATP needs to be produced inside the flagellum, or is diffusion fast enough to diffuse from the cell body along the fl flagellum? Um, I guess it's a question of around what is the function of that that flagellar glycolysis pathway and the adenylate kinases and the nucleoside dikinases that you that you find in the flagellum are you able to speculate a little bit please so not all flagella will uh produce atp within their flagellum or cilium um only some have been recorded as doing so and having the necessary enzymes um for the ones that don't that's where yeah adenylate kinase and other energy shuttles are very important to allow rapid transit um, um of atp um Okay, thank you. When you, and again, staying with you, Michael, when, when you do the physical separation before the protein analysis, is it flagella somewhere that are cut along their length or are they, they, they ripped from the cell body? Um, and, and a little bit about the, the, the various sensory parts that you were able to isolate. Yep, you, you managed to see those, those proteins, although they're at the base of the flagellum or are they further along the flagellum? Yeah, so euglena gracilis is observed. Uh, it will preferentially detach its flagella just after the, bay, uh, the paraflagella body. Um, so that's what the majority of the flagella um, that are detached will look like, and only a minority will have the whole flagella detached. Okay. Um, and, and yes, various sensory parts. So, so yeah, that seems to be a, a conscious uh, choice by Euglena gracilis that it doesn't want to have to go to the trouble of regenerating its whole flagella if it can help it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn back to Malika, please. Could you, could, could, could you please repeat the plasmid that you use for transforming Euglena? And was your transformation a nuclear transformation? And was it stable or transient, please? I think there's uh, a little bit more clarity on the, on the, on the methods there. Yeah, we used uh, uh, a plasmid for uh, used uh, with, with the uh, Clabidomonas erinaldi. The name, I can write it to you because it's a, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pop, pop, uh, I, I will send it. I will send the name of the the plasmid, and uh, yes, the, um, the transformation is uh, stable. We have it. Uh, we have the mutant uh, since the, uh, one year ago, uh, and they are uh, and, and and they still have the, the mutation. So they are st stable. And we tried uh, different media. We uh, uh, and we. Uh, we, we tried different media without uh, the antibiotic, and we still have uh, when we put them back in the, the medium with streptomycin, they still have the mutation. So they are uh, stable, yes. Okay, thank you. And before I turn back to Michael with another question, I'm going to stay with you, Malika, and whether you might comment on another couple of questions that have appeared. Um, did you test other plasmids? It's a question around which plasmids would you recommend for expressing genes in euglena? Um, and did you investigate any other antibiotics, antibiotics that didn't affect the euglena chloroplast? Um, are, there, are there other antibiotics that, that from, from your work people might want to consider? I, I have a list of 20, uh, 20 antibiotics. I have an example here, uh, like uh, tetracycline, uh, tiamulin, <laughs> um, aparomycin, they, they affect the ribosome, but they didn't, uh, they, they, they don't have any effect on, uh, on Aguilena. And uh, the, the, the three, the only three in which we get, uh, uh, we got uh, an effect, the, they are streptomycin, spectinomycin, and uh, uh, cyclohexamide. In which uh, they have an they have an effect on the proteomic uh, translation. 
putting it to the yeah. Okay, thank you, Malika. Michael, I'm, I'm going to turn back to you. You covered this, I think, a little bit at the start of your talk, but are you able to comment on what what function the second shorter flagellum has, apart from possibly providing the, the support function to the longer emergent flagellum? And you spoke about that. Functions of the, the second shorter flagellum, please. Yeah, that's the most commonly speculated function is providing mechanical support because it's often seen sneaking around or just associated with it. Um, it's ambiguous over what its motility is because as you as you um, section the uh, non-emergent flagellum, the central stalk, which indicates a motile flagella, tends to sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. As you get to the tip. Um, certainly not uh, involved in uh, photosensitive behaviour. Okay, thanks, Michael. We've got a question from Mark Blackster. For Kazuharu, but actually open to everybody, does anyone in the conversation have experience with the performance of the PacBio Hi-Fi circular consensus data on euglena or euglenoid genomes? Well, I don't have any experience. I only use Nanopore. So no experience from you. If there's anybody that, that's happy to share their experience now, um, if, you, if you just want to put yourself off mute and, 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 and indicate that experience. Yeah, so, so I think for me, it's not experience. I think um, Jonas did cover something like that, but I'm not sure it has been applied on uh, Euglena yet or Euglenoids from Jonas' uh, presentation earlier on. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then coming back to you, Kazahara, we've got a question from, from Scott Farrow. What happened when you knocked out the, the, the base J genes? Um, is there any phenotype, any behavioral change? Is there anything from, from that work in progress that you're able to comment on? Uh, we've just started on the knockout, so we are really curious uh, what it turns out, but uh, we still haven't have the result yet. Okay, thank you. That's lovely. And then I think we've come to the end of the questions that are there in the chat. Before I ask if there's anybody that would like to ask their question um, in, in person, we've got a, a request from Thank God Please. We'd like to take some, some photographs at the end of the, the meeting, the end of the session today. So if people are willing to put their videos on, if privacy allows, then that would be great as those, as those photographs are taken. So I'm going to I'm going to close off the, the, the chat as it appears on my screen um, and ask, is there anybody that's got a final question that they would like to ask of any of the speakers thus far from the second half of today's session? Yeah, so for me, again, it's not a question. It's more of, I think, with uh, Kazuharu's uh, work so far, uh, maybe it's something we may want to discuss uh, in the when Nehal and yourself and um, Paul Zimba will be talking on how we can start putting all of this together. You know, there's lots of genome activities ongoing here and there. So I feel that we'll benefit more when everyone, when we pull all of this as the Iglena Genome Project. I mean, I can see some progress already here and there, but. This is something we might want to start thinking about uh, particularly. So just like what Kazu, uh, Kazuhari was talking about, that if, we have, if someone wants to use the genome, um, they could actually reach out and collaborate. But I think when we have that platform of EGP, then we'll have the monthly meetings or once in two months meetings, then that would help to you know, naturally connect that you know, in the pipeline. So that's just a comment. So maybe again, we can, uh, I know Mark Blackstar has you know, with the tree of life and um, the whole during that time they will want to comment on what this some of these possibilities could be with some of the progresses they made specifically in invertebrates and also in protists it would be nice to hear from the darwin tree of life and the sangan tree of life as well okay thanks thank god there's lots of cameras that have been switched on are you wanting to take photographs while neil's going to talk or are you going to want to take photographs at the end after Neil talks before we all depart? What do you prefer to yeah, do? Yeah, I think I think at the end after Neil's talk, if, if Neil's fine with it at the end, I think that would be nice. Okay, we've already yeah. started to see those video cameras go off. So if people <laughs> want to switch their videos off until after Neil has spoken, then please feel free. I'm rather hoping that Neil's going to speak for three of us, myself, Paul, and himself. Neil, can I pass to you to talk a little bit about what we're hopefully going to see happen in terms of a world of euglenid sequencing, please? And you're still on mute. 
Yeah, you're setting me up to disappoint you a little bit, I think. But well, uh, disappoint me. <laughs> that's right. But um, okay, so I am going to speak on behalf of all of us. I've even put your name on the slide, Michael. Um, so um, I, I meant to be, I was down to update on the, the work of uh, the Network Scientific Committee. Um, and um, so I am speaking on behalf of myself and really all the committee, including Michael and Paul, who are the co chairs. Um, and what, um, and just to introduce who we are, um, let's see if I can move this slide forward. Um, uh, so this is who's on the, the science committee and really what we've been doing in the last year is it, uh, is uh, coordination. It says coordination. I don't know what that means of genomic efforts, um, uh, around the, um, various members, uh, looking at the criteria for species prioritization sharing knowledge on what funding is available and um, also uh, sort of helping thank God where we can with the Euglena network position paper and all of these efforts really are around making sure that as a community we're best placed to take advantage of um, the funding opportunities in, in our various different countries and and it says in the title of this talk that I should be um, talking about a, a a euglenoid genome project and and i think what that looks like in the current sort of international funding sort of ecosystem is actually coordination with a, within our own nations which is where funding is available um or, or large areas such as the european union uh, and but making sure that the efforts are coordinated uh, by this um community so just to talk a bit more about that uh so there are several, these, this is an exhaustive list, but you know, genome projects which are interested, should be of interest to this community, Darwin Tree of Life project. And what I'll talk about at the end of this talk is, is how, um, you know, the Euglena species are going to be handled through the Darwin Tree of Life project. There's a new, um, which, and I'll talk a little bit about what that project is at the moment. There's a European reference genome atlas consortium, which is being put together, which is expecting to get some significant European Union money to do eukaryotic genome sequencing. Um, and also there's larger consortia such as the Earth Biogenome Project, which is really a consortia of consortia, uh, which has a number of either taxonomically based genome projects, such as the, you know, the bat genome projects or the vertebrate genome projects, but also uh, nationally organized genome projects. So the Darwin Tree of Life is a sort of a member project of the Earth Biogenome. So there are, are large, you know, um, projects out there to, for, uh, for us to engage with. And I think it's important that we are all sort of on the same page. So one of the things that we've been doing is coming up with a list of what euglenoids are uh, um, available, what samples are available uh, around the world, in, uh, either you know, in the UK, in the US, Canada, uh, across Europe, etc. And so we have this you know, online uh, Excel spreadsheet. It's that simple, or a Google spreadsheet. If you want to um, be able to add something to that or access that, speak to Ross Lowe, who's been doing a lot of the organization for the scientific committee. So this means that we have a, 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 a kind of a species list and where we can get samples from. So should uh, opportunities to get these uh, species sequenced, we can be able to see who's doing it and whether there are any ongoing projects, including the, uh, those species. And also, you know, thank God's been putting forward this position paper. And this is kind of really important because once this, we get this published, uh, it's a citable link to demonstrate there's a global community effort and it provides an international strategy, which means we have some credibility when, it, when we go to funders to say, we're engaged with an international community. This international community has a strategy and there's a paper about it and it's citable. Um, so I'm just going to go on now to talk about how we're working within the Darwin Tree of Life project. And fortunately, Mark Blackster, who's the PI of this project, is uh, at this meeting. So if there are any questions, we can call on him to answer them. Uh, it's coordinated, but this is led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute under Mark. Um, and it aims to sequence the genomes of all described species in, uh, uh, of eukaryotic organisms in Britain and Ireland. It's got a first base funded uh, through the Wellcome Trust and is aiming to produce chromosomal level assemblies of all, all these eukaryotic species. And it re is really working off species lists. Um, so um, 
we've been working at Earlham with Oxford University and others uh, in the UK um, to um, uh, generate um, a list of, of uh, protest samples, because we're responsible for secrets in the protests, um, from uh, across the UK. Uh, so these were then grown up by culture collections, uh, Oxford involved in doing genome size estimates and barcoding, and then the Sanger Institute will take those samples, extract large quantities of DNA and do um, high resolution, um, long read sequencing, etc., on them. And we're also doing an environmental sampling strategy, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, which is isolating cells in the environment and doing whole genome amplification. So this is the Darwin Tree of Life, euglenoid species list. Uh, so these are species which are in culture in the UK and that can be sourced to the UK. Now, the reason that the, the Darwin Tree of Life is focusing on UK species is simply because we're kind of sequencing the biodiversity in the UK and we, it's not... This is, uh, um, we don't want to be sort of trying to plunder other countries for their own biodiversity and it saves a lot of paperwork if you're not moving samples between different nation states um, so um, the um, so this this species list is basically what's available in culture collections and we've prioritized uh, things which are um, uh, should we're hoping to sequence in the pilot phase and this is largely down to having some taxonomic diversities um, and also in, as focusing on those species which we can easily get into as Zenic culture. And the other species hopefully will be sequenced in later phases of the project. I won't go into great detail about this, uh, but this is the, the process that is set up at the Sanger Institute. When a sample arrives, it's barcoded, DNA is extracted, um, and then high C and long read sequencing and RNA sequencing takes place. There's an assembly and curation of that assembly. So we hopefully get chromosome level assembly from it. And then there's a database submission to ENA and um, Ensemble uh, undertakes um, uh, gene finding and feature annotation. Um, and importantly, the data is, is a very transparent project. You can track samples, you can see the data as it's generated and it's published openly in a micro publication, which I'll just mention a bit more about later. So if you go to the Darwin Tree of Life portal, the, the, the website's there, you'll see the first euglenoid species is actually been submitted, uh, ready for uh, sequencing. And hopefully soon you'll then be able to see the sequence data um, QC as it's uh, made available and you can see the metadata of the sample that's been submitted and it's all available at that in those websites and also when the paint the, the genome is is finished and annotated it's micro published you know in welcome open research uh, there's a there's a website for the Darwin Tree of Life gateway with a picture of Mark Blackster on it um, to um, uh, and basically the, these publications uh, essentially will just say there's a genome, the data is available here. This is sort of rough details, about, some details about where the sample came from and any particular um, um, notable things about it. And it will make sure all the people involved in generating that genome and the annotation and the assembly get a, a citable um, reference. But it means there's no restriction on future use or publication. Uh, of analysis of that data. So it's made freely available as quickly as humanly possible. Um, so as well as the, the, um, these culture-based reference genomes, we're also undertaking environmental sampling of protists from the environment. So essentially doing sorting of cells into microtiter plate and then doing single cell genome and transcriptome sequencing. And we're in the process of trying to marry that up with community-based metagenomic sequencing. And this should be able to produce all of the, lots of genomes from um, uh, organisms which aren't in cultures, which is probably the vast majority of protist, protist species and euglena species uh, there are. Um, so some, I can give you some early view of what that data looks like. So this was one of our first pilot plates of different protists from the environment which also included a number of euglena, um, which we sequenced. And so this is a, 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 an example of a, an assembly we got from two cells of euglena 
so which were sorted from the environment. We managed to get a half a gigabase roughly assembly in about 151,000 contigs, which is an M50 of 3.3 KB. Um, it was close, most closely related to this organism. And although our bus go is, as people have discussed before, we had 1.3% complete, it was only marginally worse than the, one of the early Euglena gracilis assemblies. So we should be able to generate some kind of really useful data from this sort of thing as well. So in summary, um, we have, um, uh, we should see in the next year, a number of high quality Euglena genomes being publicly available. Uh, all data will be open and unrestricted for use after it's published in these micro publications. And we're also generating these GMT seq assemblies, and they should also um, uh, um, be available in the coming year, um, which will be draft, but they should provide a useful resource for comparative analysis. So just to thank all the people involved in that work and also all the people on the scientific committee. So. So, thanks very much, Neil. I guess, thank God, this is the point at which you'd like people to start switching their videos back on it. So yes, yeah. So, if people. if no one has any questions for Neil, I was gonna I was gonna ask as we see those videos go on. Is there anybody that's got any question that they'd like to ask of Neil, please? And I think I'm going to take silence. There's no questions. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to pass to you in just a second. Mark a question. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm just going to. I'm just going to say my last bit before I pass to, to thank God, which is thank you everybody for your patience this afternoon and for joining in the the, the discussion in the chat for all of our speakers. So I pass back to you, please, thank God. All right, thank you, um, uh, Michael, for actually helping to, sh to share the session and for everyone for, com uh, for coming. So I'm just gonna take some pictures. So maybe also Rose Low, just in case you're still here, please also feel free to kind of take uh, just in case uh, mine doesn't work. <laughs> so it's mainly for the, maybe for the website or other things. Um, I also, we're kind of we're kind of recording this, and we did say that if people didn't want it to be recorded, then they can tell us. So if you don't want to appear, you can then switch off your your video. So I'm gonna just do the screenshots. Uh, just one minute. So, so I'm taking the first one. There are multiple of them so I'm just gonna take them individually and I'm going to the second one I suppose this is marginally easier than a real conference where you have to get everyone standing in lines on steps somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Should just all submit a picture of ourselves and you can make a little mosaic. <laughs> then the third one. And then the final one. All right, perfect. So just to clarify, Ross, did you manage to take some as well on your end? Yeah, I got some as well. All right, perfect. So we have four, four slides, basically. Okay, I'll pass this back to Michael. Uh, I think we have just four minutes more or something. So Michael, over to you. Um, okay, thanks. Thank God. If there's, if there's no other questions that anybody would like to ask of anybody, then I guess... It's a thank you for everybody for, 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 for persevering through the afternoon. This is the point where we, I guess we can yeah. depart unless there's others that want to, to stay on to say hello to, 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 to colleagues. If not yeah, yeah. so we have this next session tomorrow, um, the next day, the day two of the conference tomorrow uh, is going to focus. So today's, uh, one, today's 
sessions focus purely on basic biology. Tomorrow's session will focus purely on ecology and environment. Then the session on Wednesday will focus purely on um, evolution. And the fifth one will focus on translation and commercialization. So that is where we'll see what people have been doing with uh, Eglino. So we have ex exhibitions scheduled for those days as well. So I think it's gonna be interesting, all of the sessions. Okay, cool. All right, thank you.